Welcome to this very special edition of the KJ Masterclass Live, the show which ensures that you profit from your time spent here with experts, either through their industry insights, information, or simply learning from them. And today we have John Colliver, former blue man, professional clown turned communication trainer, and professional speaker. Welcome to the show, John. Hey, AJ, great to be here. How is the weather in New Delhi? The weather is very good, a bit more, you know, uh, on the humid side, unlike earlier on. Some people say it's the impact of climate change. I don't know what to say of this because I don't want to get committed on either side of this climate change debate. So it is better to keep quiet and bear with it and be happy about it. Rather, Excellent. Be, be more happy with talking about, you know, happiness, about humor and humor in business and especially presentations and learning about them, which can bring you, you know, more money into your bank account and you can laugh all the way to the bank. So welcome <laughs> to the show, John, once again. Just tell us what is it that a clown, professional clown, clown does at Google and many other places and what does he teach us there? What does he teach there and what can people learn from you? Obviously, we'll learn from you how to add humor to our presentations, especially for people who are not that funny. So let's begin from there. Great. Yeah. Uh, well, first of all, thanks so much for having me on the uh, podcast, uh, AJ. And yes, uh, I teach public speaking at Google here in silicon valley but i was a clown and a blue man in a prior life uh and what i teach is not standard public speaking it's actually kind of clown stuff but i don't really say that because clown isn't super cool to talk about uh sometimes to business folks but the fact is it's an incredible method of connection it's a great way to develop connection and i'm not talking about red noses and floppy shoes or anything like that I'm talking about a heightened state of presence and connection with your audience. Right. And you're great at it. I've watched your your uh, podcast, AJ, and, and you're always leaning forward and connected to your guests and aware of your audience. And that's really what it's about. It's being connected and aware with your audience. And additionally, uh, it's enjoying it. It's there's a term called le jeu. It's uh, it's French for the game, but basically it means finding pleasure and joy in connection with your audience. And that can be really hard for folks if they have a lot of stage fright or nervousness, which is totally understandable. Um, but there are methods to build that confidence in a way. So they're so excited to connect. And from there, you can leap off into having fun with your audience, playing with your audience, even in very serious topics. You can still have a like enjoyment and joy in that connection. Thank you for your kind words, Don. Uh, I, I, but I can tell you right now, I want to be a very keen learner of your uh, of your communication. Uh, uh, what do you call uh, speciality? Your art in that because that's very important in today's time especially in business settings which are getting much more drab and dry you know much more like like the earlier delhi weather when it used to be dry so they are becoming <laughs> you know much more harder and drier than earlier than what it is so in that perspective uh, your uh, your inputs will certainly help John, your mission is to help every communicator profoundly impact their audience through the power of authenticity, listening, and play the secrets of clowns. So tell us about this first, and then we'll come to the craft part of it. Great. Yes, I think the so it's authenticity, listening, and play. It all starts with authenticity for me. And the baseline there is... Uh, you are already enough. I want your audience to understand they are already enough. They already have enough 
inside them enough life experience, enough weirdness to make people interested and uh, speak compellingly. They don't need to add anything on or build anything more. It's already there. Uh, My work is about clearing the blocks away so we can see more of just pure AJ. You know what I mean? So there's no nothing in the way. So once you realize you are enough, you can start to really partner with your audience or listen to them and build your presentations while listening. It's not just a, a memorized recitation. You're kind of doing a dance with them. The clown term is complicite. You're, I, I like to imagine if you start a presentation on two sides of a table, right? And I'm speaking across the table trying to communicate my message to you. What I'm trying to do is get us both on the same side of the table, looking across at the message together. And we're working together to understand the message. Uh, And then finally, once you build that, you can start to play. You can start to have fun and find patterns. And uh, that's where the humor comes in. If you try and push the humor too quick, it's going to feel a little bit much. It's going to feel a little bit yucky. Does that make sense? Yes, perfect sense. And let's make it much more, you know, uh, more sense for them. Because a lot of people think, you know, how do I learn something from Don? And how will I imbibe the tips that Don has, you know, uh, got through all those years of experience? So it's better to tell them how you began with, you know, where you began from. Because you say that from the first moment I showed my authentic, imperfect self on stage in my first clown class, I knew I had discovered the secret to connecting in any kind of presentation situation. And then you say, please don't let your clown associations scare you. Please tell us so that people who are introvert, extrovert, or whatever they are, they know that if Don can learn it, Don can be his, you know, if imperfection can lead to a perfect situation when Don can teach at Google, and hundreds of other top places, then it is very easy for them to learn from within the confines of their room, from wherever they are. So let's begin from there. Why, what you want to say, and why do you say, please don't let your clown associations scare you? Sure. Well, first I'll address your, don't let your clown associations scare you. In the, sorry about that. In the United States, there's a thing about scary clowns, okay? Okay like the movie it from stephen king people there's there's a there's a image of that in pop culture so i just i i would like people to set that aside for a second we're not talking about those kind of scary clowns but uh the first time i did a clown exercise in a clown class it was called save the show and it's a terrifying exercise What happens is the class sits in the audience with the instructor and you stand on stage behind a curtain. And your job is to step out from the curtain with no preparation and make the audience laugh as fast as possible. And as you can imagine, it is terrifying. It is absolutely terrifying first, and it's completely impossible. So because you try all these things like trip and fall and and people are like, this is painful. I can't watch this person trying so hard. And I was doing that and I was sweating and and freaking out and silence, no laughs until finally I stopped. I took a breath. I looked at the audience. I said, what do you what do you guys want? And they all laughed. They all laughed that moment. I acknowledged what was going on in the moment. Uh, And so that's when I started to realize, oh, the secret to connection is acknowledging what is going on right now between me and my audience. What's going on out there in the audience? What's going on with me? Not pretending like everything is perfect if there's a car alarm going off or something like that. It is acknowledging what is going on and having the confidence to continue forward. That will show your humanity and really connect your audience to you. Um, I remember also when I started doing clown performances, this is where humor starts. Uh, I often would do them in a completely pitch black theater. 
Uh, it would just be me on stage. I couldn't see the audience. It was very hard to connect with them doing a silent bit. And sometimes I would hear a sneeze or someone would drop a glass or something. If I would suddenly just look in the direction of the sound and just look, that's all I would need to do. It would get a laugh. Like simply acknowledging what was going on in the audience would get a laugh. And so that's kind of the beginning of how to add humor to your presentations and how to connect is acknowledging what's going on in the audience. And I have three specific tips to uh, incorporate humor in your presentations whenever you're ready for those two. Right. Now people are ready. If Don can learn it, even when he thinks it was a, you know, it was an imperfect hymn but a perfect situation for people to laugh, then people are ready to, you know, actually learn what they should learn from a person like you, how to add humor to your presentation if you are not funny. So the first thing I want to understand for the audience, Don, is that what is the funny part here? Is it the fun, funny humor? Who is the... Uh, funny part what you speak should be funny or the way you should talk should be funny uh, how how it, it works in a business setting let's now come to the business of things now how does how does somebody who is giving a presentation sharing a speech with people add humor to something which may be not so humorous or which is a very drab thing and where there is a you know, a lot of chance for humor to step in. So how does it work? Absolutely. Yes. Um, well, first of all, I, I want to double down on the pattern aspect because the secret to having humor without being funny or talking in a funny voice or writing a joke or something like that is being aware of patterns. Uh, a guy named Alistair Cook proposed a theory in 2008 called the pattern recognition theory of humor. And basically what that means is hu humans laugh, find things funny when an established pattern is disrupted. So if you establish a pattern and then disrupt it, people will laugh. Uh, it's like the peekaboo. It's like with a baby. If you like peekaboo, the baby laughs when you suddenly break the pattern and say peekaboo. The baby expects this and then you do this and the baby laughs. That's the basic uh, idea. And the safest way in like a serious presentation or something like that is to acknowledge a shared challenge. Like if, for example, it's humid in New Delhi, you could acknowledge the shared challenge of the weather or something like that because it's immediate and it's a shared experience. Uh, kind of, here's three tips that you can kind of easy for non-humorist people to add. The most obvious one is the rule of three. Reason being, three is the shortest uh, distance to create a pattern, a pattern of three. So if you have a list of something, you do same, same, different. So say, for example, um, I was prepping for my interview with AJ today. I really wanted to do a good job. So I put on my nice shirt. I got a good sleep. And then a third one could be something silly. I got a good sleep and I also um, drank four, 40 gallons of coffee. Something uh, same, same, then something unusual, something heightened, something silly. So that's an easy way to add humor into some portion of your presentation, the rule of three. The other thing, this, this is a very clown idea, is if they like it, do it more. If they don't like it, stop doing it. So this means listening. If you say something as, as you're going through your presentation, I'll never do that again. It gets a giggle from the audience. Put a pin in that. Say that phrase again later. I'll never do that again either. It'll probably get another laugh. So that means listening for when something organically gets a laugh and then repeating it later in your presentation when you can. And then if it stops getting laughed, don't do it. But that's that's kind of one of the basic ways of building a clown bit is listening when you get a reaction and just doing it more. Simply doing more what gets a reaction. Uh, does that make sense? Yes, yes, it does. 
it does. Uh, uh, actually, you know, uh, let's make it much more, you know, easier for people to understand. Uh, help them understand what you are teaching at people at Google. What is it that they are learning from you or any other place that you teach? What is it that you teach? Because that's what a lot of people would, you know, understand that this is what is more relevant for them to understand in terms of uh, something that is coming from you and which is related to humor or making something, you know, funny enough for audience to be engaged to what they are presenting. Sure. I think the biggest foundation I teach at Google is building people to that feeling of they are enough. I deal with a lot, lot of non-native speakers at Google, obviously, folks from India, folks from China, and uh, sometimes their grammar, they're a little bit concerned about their grammar in presentations and things like that. And uh, I really, and, and their confidence level is low. And so my first job is helping them understand that they are enough and that they, they are great as they are already. And I do that by a few with a few uh, methods. First of all, I make sure that they have lots of low stakes situations to practice. That's the most important thing, finding yourself a low stakes, regular place to practice. I think there's Toastmasters over there in India. You can join uh, maybe your spiritual community, finding opportunities where you can speak and there's not a lot of pressure. The way not to do it is have one really important presentation once a year and then be nervous about it and, and practice and be all concerned and then do that. It's easier if you do it a lot in a uh, low pressure situation. And then another suggestion I would say is limit negative feedback. When you're just starting trying to build confidence, you might tell people, hey, just tell me what I did good right now. That's all I want to know. You can get to the constructive feedback later. There's plenty of time for that. Right now, you just need positive feedback to keep you going, to keep you doing these low stakes uh, uh, practice. Because I'll tell you what, I find a lot of these problems like filler words, stuttering, forgetting your uh, lines, they go away if you just practice. You don't even need to think about it. It will just get better. And speaking of that, I often recommend what we call in the States improv classes. Uh, right. And this is improvisational comedy classes. And there's a whole bunch of uh, virtual ones. So your audience could easily join a, a virtual improv comedy class uh, from their home. And uh, what this does is it puts you in a situation, which I'm sure you know about, ad-libbing, uh, yes. where you have to respond in the moment and what that does is after a while, you start to realize, hey, I can respond in the moment and it might even be better than something I wrote before. Maybe my impulsive response will be better and more compelling than something I worried about and wrote last night and rewrote it five times. Uh, so I really like I, I'll let me see if I can give you an example of a, of a there's a place called the world's greatest improv school. And if you Google that. Uh, uh, the guy, Will Hines, has a whole bunch of classes you can take online, and um, that'll be a great base for this kind of thing. Right, right, Don. Now, talking of improv, how can people connect with you for that? Because I, it's, I, I normally I ask about these details at the end of the show, but I would take this opportunity so that, you know, this thing does not get off my mind. It means I, tend, I can tend to be forgetful sometimes. So I just want to register that within the show itself at this stage. So can you tell us how can people make use of this particular resource of yours? How do they can connect with you? Sure. I think uh, if your audience out there is interested in improv, a great way to start would be from a free exercise that I wrote. Uh, and you can get that if you just go to doncolliver.com forward slash wink dash exercise. And I'll send you this one page exercise. It's called an audience engagement exercise. And what it's going to do is it makes you tell a story in front of a group of three people. And as much as you think you need to focus on that story, you need to focus on that audience. And it's going to make it very difficult for you to continue focusing on your story because you need to focus on that audience. 
And it's a great exercise that you can uh, use to build this, this skill. Right. And who is this improv thing for? Because you see a, a lot of market for uh, comedy shows, a lot of people who are you doing stand up comedy, a lot of people have that aspiration. And then people want to use even improvisation in their day to day setting means there can be a counter question, even during a job interview, it can be a difficult situation where they want to test how exactly you react to a particular question or a situation. I, I see it in several aspects of, uh, of our day to day lives. But from your perspective, who do you think should be looking at improvisation, learning about it more uh, so that it becomes much more, you know, focused? I'll be honest, AJ, I think anyone who presents or is ever put in a situation where they have to respond in a high pressure situation like a job interview would absolutely benefit from improvisational training. Uh, reason being, it gets you listening and gets you present in the moment. And it allows you to use your entire, because every everybody's really smart. You're very, very smart. But if you're all locked down to your script, you don't get to use that entire brain space that you have, your entire years of experience. And getting comfortable in improvisation, you can draw on all that information you already have in your brain and bring your full self to those situations, be it a job interview, be it a... Uh, uh, some kind of a difficult presentation you need to give, maybe difficult, have a difficult conversation with an organizational team. Uh, I think improvisational comedy is a great way to get skills around that. Right, right. Now, Don, let's look at these two situations. One is that uh, people, there's a bit of public speaking involved. So for leadership, even for people who are doing sales work or anybody else there you need to interact with a particular type of audience either it's a bigger audience larger audience or even a smaller audience and second thing is presentation when you are actually giving presentation within a few uh, number of people maybe it's a client presentation it's a pitch uh, during that time or with the, it can be an internal presentation how are these two settings different uh, if they are similar, how do you uh, treat uh, these situations for an individual who is presenting or who is doing public speaking? And what should they keep in mind to make it uh, a bit, uh, you know, humorous or funny? So the question, just to rephrase your question, uh, how would it differ from a large group presentation versus a small team presentation in terms of right. prep? Right. Sure. Uh, well, I always recommend five to seven run-throughs of your presentation, but in a very specific way, uh, because the, the reason for rehearsing quite a bit is not to memorize. You don't want to memorize your presentation, but you want to be so confident, so aware of the next point that's coming that you can split your attention between both what you're trying to talk about and how the audience is reacting. Like if you are delivering some information to your team and it's clear it is not going over well, you don't want to keep plowing through that information. You want to see what's going on. You want to interact with them and maybe uh, change what you're saying a little bit because you are taking you are in connection with your audience. But so, like I said, five to seven run throughs. I like to always do one run through by myself where as I'm speaking my presentation, I use super big gestures. Like I run around my room, no matter how serious the presentation is, I'll crawl on the ground, I'll move my hands, something to really get in my body. You would never do that in the real presentation, obviously, but it's going to get it into your body. Then another time I'll do the same thing, but with my voice. So I'll go through the same presentation, but I'll sound my voice really loud. I'll be talking really loud, talking really soft. I'll speak really softly. Then I'll talk really loud. Like something really where you'll start to notice that your voice naturally changes based upon different parts of your presentation. And obviously, again, you wouldn't speak like this in the actual presentation, 
but there will be a residual amount of that vocal variety that's going to make your presentation more compelling and more interesting. Right. Now, in terms of presentation, uh, Don, how would one know that they are actually engaging their audience? Now, suppose if it's a leadership and, and he is speaking in front of his employees, so everybody will laugh even if it's at his poor jokes or bad jokes. <laughs> Okay, and yeah. somebody who is not at that level may actually, you know, give a good presentation and add humor to it, but people will not laugh. So how would they know in such situations or something like that, uh, where audience is disinterested? Maybe it's in a in a, a, a in a say bar or any other situation where people are busy doing their own stuff. So how would you know to keep your motivation up that people you are engaging the audience and actually if you if they are not you are not able to engage them then how do you do that right without being nervous about it well they're a great question excellent question it's one of the main ones i get uh with these uh, when i'm teaching at google or for diff for sales engineers if they're giving webinars online and they're just getting no response at all, like kind of some kind of demo, uh, here's what I say. Build in engagement moments in your presentation. And there are four ways to do that. First, you acknowledge what the audience is doing at some point. You can say to them, it looks like uh, you're a, a little bit distracted right now. Or AJ, you're really paying attention to this. Is this making sense? You can, acknowledging what they're saying will immediately engage the entire audience. There's actually a study done about that uh, in 2010, I believe. Uh, it was in a big university lecture hall and all the students had a dial of how engaged they were. And it was like some kind of biology lecture, very boring. And the teacher found that if the teacher mentioned something about a specific student in the auditorium, like, Bill, it looks like you're really understanding what I'm talking about. The entire auditorium's engagement increased. So simply acknowledging one person is going to engage the entire audience. I think it might be like, oh, my gosh, he may be looking at me, too. So it's a way to bring them in. Uh, a second way is make it present. This is a second way to engage an audience. Uh, you can ask them to grab a piece of paper. You can ask them to do something physically uh, let's all take a breath together. It feels like this is getting a little dry. Let's all take a breath together. This will immediately engage the audience. It makes them present, stops them thinking about their grocery list or what they need to do for their wife or something like that later. Uh, you can tell a personal story. This is another thing you can do to engage an audience because it feels like, oh, this is different. This, this is different than this dry presentation. He's telling something that's not on the script. That will make people engaged. And lastly, and this is the common way to engage an audience, you can give them a task. You can have them do a quiz. You can do an exercise. You can do some kind of a thing like that. You have them talk to their neighbor. Hey, why don't you ask your neighbor if they have any experiences with this specific talk of topic we're talking about? That's another way you can engage the audience. It's That is the way if I've lost my audience or I am trying to gauge if they're following me, I use one of those techniques. Right. Right. Now, Don, there are people who are a bit nervous. They are good speakers. They can be, you know, especially you see uh, during COVID, a lot of people can be a bit humorous in their uh, in their real life around in, in their, you know, situations around. But when you go on Zoom with 200 people, then the situation is different. Now, how do not only online, even offline, if people are nervous, what do you recommend them to do? to be able to be themselves and also be add, you know uh, play with some some humor in whatever they are saying or speaking to the audience that they are speaking to absolutely well first of all I'll just reiterate low stakes practice low stakes regular practice uh, finding a supportive group where you can come and give low stakes presentations will do wonders that's obvious uh, secondly Deep breathing, uh, there are very specific techniques, box breathing, you can Google that. Uh, something to use your diaphragm 
that engages the parasympathetic nervous system, which physically you cannot help but relax yourself if you breathe in that certain way. It's a way to kind of trick your body into releasing stress. Um, another more kind of esoteric way that works for me, it doesn't work for everybody. Sometimes I'll be really nervous about a presentation. I speak at a lot of technical trade shows, like uh, high tech trade shows. And uh, a lot of times the people I'm speaking to know a lot more about the subject than I do. I get very, very nervous. But when I realize and shift my mindset to, but I do have some knowledge that could really be of service to these people, shifting to a helpful be of service mindset kind of takes the pressure off a little bit for me. Like, I want to help these folks. I have this knowledge. I want to give it to them. That can sometimes uh, help me relax a little bit. And lastly, uh, so another thing that sometimes works for some people, sometimes doesn't, is when you're breathing, if you are very, very nervous, try to visualize where that nervousness resides in your body and simply think about it. What color is it? What shape is it? Is it soft? Is it hard? And what that's doing is it's kind of separating you from your nervousness. That's what all of this is doing, getting you to be a, an observer of your nervousness rather than embodying your nervousness. And yeah, some things work for some people, some people, some things work for other people, but it's a matter of experimenting and figuring out what works best for you. Right. Now, in uh, mostly in work settings, uh, Don, people, uh, their job is to make sure that others are doing their work seriously. And they also tend to become serious because of that, you know, and seriously serious, actually. And, and you know, but they can be good, humorous people from inside. That work setting does not allow. Suppose they want to be a bit of, you know, add humor to their uh, presentation to with, with their subordinates, with the people there who they report to. Now, how do you add humor without them then not taking you seriously? How do you balance that? Great point. Great point. Well, there was a study done that came up with something called the Prattfall effect in 1966. And what they found was uh, they had two groups of people delivering presentations. Uh, one group was highly competent and they would all spill their coffee. And the other group was incompetent. They did not prepare, and they also spilled their coffee. Uh, so it was kind of figuring out uh, how uh, a hiccup in the presentation affected the likability of the presenter. What they found was the highly competent, extremely capable, well-prepared presenters who simply had an error, they spilled their coffee while they're presenting, the audience loved them. They liked them better than the, the highly competent presenters that did not spill their coffee. So that imperfection actually increased warmth, increased engagement with the audience. However, the group that did not prepare, the group that was incompetent and then spilled their coffee, the audience did not like them at all. They just wanted to be like, get out of there. So the lesson is, be very well prepared. If you are extremely well prepared in your presentation in front of your team and you have maybe you you have some imperfection in your presentation, you make fun of yourself perhaps a little bit, they're going to lean forward and engage with you and find you warm and friendly. Uh, it goes without saying the only safe place to make fun of is yourself. You can never make fun of your audience. You can never make fun of what they find important. The okay. safest thing to do is make fun of yourself. Okay. Okay. Now, my last question on this, uh, John, is that a lot of people, uh, the work that they do are in social media. Their job is to make their company, uh, their work, their messaging, uh, come out and engage with their stakeholders. There also you find uh, a bit of humor or a lot of grab messages. Now, how does one make their messaging or their presentation online, which makes it much more palatable for the audience, target audience, their stakeholders, 
how does it also a lot of leadership communicates through the social media how should they make it also uh, let less leadership and more of you know engagement sort of a leadership how does one exist online with a tinge of humor wow aj i feel like you could teach a master class on this one uh i imagine but uh i i i feel like that is so dependent on the audience. I, I say there's three essential questions before you even begin to write a presentation or create anything that you need to ask yourself about your audience. What is the demographic exactly? Like deeply, like what is their age? What is their education level? Uh, what, what do they find important? Um, but the most important thing of learning about your audience is like what is in it for them? Like set aside your branding, set aside the messaging you're trying to push on your audience. It's like, what value are you giving to them? Why do they want to listen to this? Um, so it's a balance of the second question, which is what do I want them to do, feel, or know after reading this, but also what's in it for them? So you have to look at that and figure out what is the benefit? Why, why do they care? And so if the question is uh, how to do, how to make uh, social media more humorous, I would say watch TikTok. I don't know. Like <laughs> that's such, that's so dependent on your specific audience demographic, what they find funny uh, that I think it just depends on the situation. Right. Right. Good point. In fact, uh, as, as I said, it all depends on the uh, company ethics and, and the, uh, you know, their sensitivities, how they want to uh, take forward their messaging. Now then, let's talk about your book, you know, uh, about your new book, Wink, Transforming Public Speaking with Clown Presence. Tell us about this, what this book is all about. What do you want to convey through this book? Well, we've kind of been covering it really well. Uh, I I had been teaching over the pandemic virtually for Google, and I realized that I was teaching a curriculum that had never been taught before. It was this clown skill that I had overlaid by straight up public speaking skills. And those things together created Wink, the book Wink because there's an entire chapter on standard preparation and uh, uh, speech writing and presentation skills, how to write an introduction, how to do a conclusion. Uh, but the majority of the book is about connection with the audience. How do I engage with the audience? How do I play with the audience in serious situations? But the basic underlying thing I'm trying to get across is your audience is already enough. All we need to do is clear away the blocks and then everybody's going to be so unique and compelling that their message, you can't help but listen to them. Like AJ, you clearly have a very specific method of delivery. It's so interesting and so honed, so interesting to watch and you are such a great interviewer that it's clear that you're very comfortable in how you show up in front of the audience. So you're a great example of what I'm talking about. Okay, and how does one get hold of this book? You know, it's a nice name, Wink, and transforming public speaking with clown presence. What does it mean? And how? where does Wink come in? And what does clown presence mean? Means it, it's a great, great name, actually. Thank you. Yes, Wink is, there's a French word called clandoy. And it means a wink towards the audience but more than just a wink, a wink kind of with a glimmer in the eye. And what it's saying is, audience, I know you're out there. You know I'm up here. You know that I know that you're out there. We both know each other are here. So we can play around because we're not. I'm not pretending that you're not there. You're not pretending you're watching a YouTube video. We are all here together so we can have some fun. That's what wink means. And uh, if your audience is interested... It's available on Amazon India uh, via Kindle if they want to reach out and grab that. Right, right. And let me ask you one more last question. What is it uh, 
an easy job is it when are you happy when you are a clown or are are you happy when you are just being yourself who is a clown in today's time because i'll i'll ask you is this when there was those movies the joker movies and all that there was so much even though those looked funny but within the dialogues i found so much of deep meaning and you know so many different characters who played that role several characters uh that a clown is not just about you know some fun and all that stuff so who is a clown and in your life when you look wanted to be a clown why was that and what exactly who are you actually are you a clown are you a communicator <laughs> or are you a teacher who is teaching at all the top places in the world who are you oh my gosh aj what a bombshell question um i think everybody is a clown i think showing up and finding the joy in connection is what i mean by clown and you can do that one to one you can do that one to many uh but once you get to that point of like i am so excited to connect with you aj with your audience with the presentation i'll do later this week in front of a group um that is i want to share myself and connect with the audience that's what clown means to me uh and it's not the it's it's not the joker it's that's that was a terrifying movie um this not, is a yeah, different not that one, that, not that one yeah. earlier one <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, the one, the bank robbery, I, I just forget all the all those names. Uh, yeah. But because I, I asked this question, uh, Don, is because you talked about, please don't let your clown associations scare you. Now, that needs a bit of understanding because it is not a simple statement. It has a lot of good meaning behind it. So if, the, if you can just tell us about that, because... What should one understand of this particular line that you have that you talk about? Yes, yes. Uh, well, in the U.S., there's a scary clown pop culture reference of a killer clown, and that is not helpful uh, to my work. Uh, so, I'm asking kindly the audience to set that aside uh, because we are speaking about more a simply a method of presence, a method of vulnerability, a method of authenticity in sharing oneself with an audience and connecting with an audience, which has nothing to do with big, scary knives or blood or anything like that. Uh, so that's what I mean by setting aside your uh, perhaps scary clown uh, references in your brain. Right, Don. Right. You know, you have covered a lot of stuff and I, I, I have also learned so much from this whole conversation. I will obviously listen to and watch it again and again to understand. But you see, this is just a show. And my show, this whole show or the audience's learning cannot be dependent on my asking the questions. I have a limitations. I can only ask some good questions and a lot many not so good questions because your answers would be dependent on that but knowledge is always there to gain out of you out of your book so how can audience connect with you engage with you and engage with you, you know businesses also can take your help and grow not only their employees but also their businesses and add some tinge of humor to their drab lives perhaps <laughs> well i would say one step uh just go to doncolliver.com forward slash wink dash exercise get that exercise practice it i think you will find that as you work that exercise you will be forced to do something silly or fun uh that's the i don't want to say anything more about the exercise you can learn once you get it okay okay then I'll also I'll add a bit of information, whatever uh, you just said, and as much as possible onto the YouTube description so that people can, you know, connect with you quicker and take your help. And in yeah, getting... like reach out to me via LinkedIn. Yeah, I'd love to connect. That's great. Great, great. Even I'll add the LinkedIn part also 
onto the YouTube notes. So thank you very much, Don. Uh, we have moved beyond 30 minutes, but it's going to be a helpful conversation as we go about in our personal lives, in our work life, or maybe even afterlife. Who hates humor after all? Nobody hates it. Yeah, indeed. Okay, and God wants happy, happy people around him. With this, with this, it's a wrap on this very special edition of the KJ Masterclass Live. Thank you once again. Thank you, AJ. Thank you.